se the sexual selection one you raised, um, and say, what is it that you think uh, hasn't been... Well, obviously, you're right, it's still going on, and there's much controversy going on. It's a very flourishing field. There are lots of people working in the field, uh, doing work in the, in the, out in, in the field on sexual selection. There are two major strands of theory of sexual selection. Um, perhaps you could just trace them to Fisher on the one hand and, well, Wallace, um, Zahavi, um, Hamilton on the other. And they're both um, very interesting theories. They both, they, they probably might, might both work. I mean, what, what's wrong with that? Uh, uh, it's a great question. Um, Here's what's wrong with it. So what, what Richard is referring to, uh, and I believe both you and I would come out on the Hamilton side of this argument, and we would both, I would imagine, be advocates for a good genes Well, no, I mean, I, I, I would be... Do we need to explain what this is? I mean, yeah, maybe. Yeah. Um, uh, Darwin noticed that uh, many biological characteristics, and animal characteristics of males especially, are apparently advertising to females, peacock's tails, um, gorgeous feathers, beautiful fish, that kind of thing. And Darwin was content simply to say, that's what females like. It's an aesthetic thing, a matter of female whim. And so in order for a male to reproduce successfully and pass on his genes, he has to be attractive, and therefore genes for being attractive get passed on to the next generation because females choose them. Wallace, the co-discoverer of natural selection, hated that idea. Uh, Wallace was more of a utilitarian and believed that um, beautiful characteristics like peacock's tails had to be useful. Uh, it wasn't enough just to simply say, females love them. You had to say, this is somehow an advertisement for a good male, a male who's going to be a good father or a good, provide good genes. Wallace wouldn't have used that phraseology, of course. And that divide between Darwin and Wallace has persisted from the 19th century through the 20th century. Um, Wallace felt that to invoke uh, female taste was bordering on mysticism. Uh, and Darwin's idea there was rescued in the 1920s and 30s by R.A. Fisher, the, one of the great founders of modern population genetics. And R.A. Fisher made the, Dar the Darwin theory respectable by allowing female choice to be under genetic control just as much as male anatomy, male tails, etc., are, uh, are under genetic control. And Fisher produced uh, a, a model which must have been a mathematical model, although he didn't lay it out in mathematical terms. It must have been there, in which natural selection simultaneously works on genes in males for being beautiful and genes in females for liking beauty. And when you realize that both baby males and baby females inherit the genes from their father for being beautiful and the genes from their mother for liking beauty, those two go together and can produce something like a peacock's tail. That was the Fisher theory which has been brought up to date by modern mathematical biologists. But the Wallace strand of theory uh, which Brett favors, and, and to some extent, so, so do I, um, agrees with Wallace that beauty has to be useful and adopts the idea that what a female is doing when she, when she is beautiful is advertising to males that she, Sorry, what a male is doing when advertising to females is advertising to females, for example, that he's healthy, that he's strong, in the extreme version of the theory due to Amos Zahavi, a male is, is advertising that he has, he's such a, a good fit male that he's capable of surviving in spite of having this ridiculous tail, um, <laughs> which should have killed him because it's vulnerable to predators, you can't fly very well with it and so on. Um, and less extreme versions of that theory are attributable to W.D. Hamilton, who thought that um, uh, health was the primary virtue which a male is advertising to females and a beautiful tail is an advertisement to a female, this is a healthy male. He's not suffering from parasites, he's resistant to, to parasites. Otherwise he wouldn't have this beautiful, glowing, sexy tail. So, um, uh, 
that was just an interruption because we were talking about um, the, 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 the Harvey Hamilton type theory which Brett favors. I'm sorry, okay. So, no, that's perfect. Yeah. Um, and it actually shows exactly the point that I was trying to make, which is that you've now heard a lot. There's plenty of good work um, that suggests that this could be a handicap um, that would demonstrate uh, the, the genes have to be heritable in order for females to be favored to be selecting for them. But the problem is that there is a rotten piece of this theory right at the heart which is that females are choosing to inflict this burden on their male offspring, which is ecologically certain to be costly to them. So if females are attempting to find good genes by putting males through a test, then they are inflicting bad genes on their male offspring. Those bad genes will be transmitted by their female offspring, but not expressed, so the females will not suffer the cost of that handicap, but there's a question of how it is that females recover enough of a benefit for their female offspring to justify the costs for the male offspring. So there's a way in which, although one can make a mathematically compelling argument for a handicap idea or, or a good genes idea, um, that it has to account for a very large benefit for female offspring, and what's worse if you imagine a species, like let's say we're talking about peacocks. Peacocks, the female, the pea hen, inflicts this marvelous tail on her male offspring by choosing fathers that have it. In peacocks, like all creatures that have these elaborate displays, males contribute nothing other than genes. So if she's picking something valuable, it has to be encoded in the genes. Um, so she inflicts this cost on her male offspring and presumably then acquires a benefit for her female offspring. But they do this each and every generation. Only a small number of males in each generation mate. Females choosing these tails pick the same males again and again. So that ought to leave the number of bad genes in the environment very small because females are eliminating those bad genes each and every generation, which means that after a small number of generations, there ought to be very little advantage in picking males with beautiful tails because there are no bad genes left. And so the question is, if one of these good genes hypotheses is correct, why is female vigilance constant? It should be females select against bad genes, the number of bad genes drops, female vigilance now has no value, female vigilance should drop, bad genes should crop back up, female vigilance should rise again and we should see an oscillating pattern, but we don't see it. What we see is generation after generation, females choose the males with the most elaborate tails. So it doesn't matter what the answer is here. The point is this is a question that year after year remains with us and we make no progress on it. We are still fumbling with explanations that have one value but don't completely answer the question. So why is that? But this is a matter for mathematical modeling, and it's being done. And there are various different mathematical models, which um, we can't go into now. But, but, but I mean, th this is something that is an active field of theoretical research, well, and it's going on. 